another week. So we all know what happened uh, last week, right? And then it started going on. Um, so it's very sad to see that there's a war going on in the 21st century. Um, we have lots of families losing home position and their sons and daughters. So this reminds me um, at one time what the pastor said. Uh, unless all of us truly accepted the son that God has provided, we will be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefield for money, for land, for position, and for power. So I hope those leaders can heard about this sentence, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so for us normal people, so we just come to our Lord, let him handle everything. Mm -hmm. So Isaiah 41 10 says, Fear not, for I'm not I'm with you, be not dismayed, for I'm your God, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteousness, right hand. So this verse is God's promise to us that he will take care of all peace because he is God, he is a savior, he is a messiah. Let's all stand up and sing a song, Jesus Messiah. He
Good morning. As we begin our time together this morning, as we have offered up praise and a song of worship to our Lord, let's look to our Lord in prayer together. Father, we're thankful for this day that brings us together. We're thankful for your love to us. We're thankful, our God, that all is well when we place ourselves in your care. And although the world around us may fall apart, we are preserved by your mighty hand. And we're thankful, our God, that no man can pluck us, no man can remove us from the hand of our loving Father. And so, Lord, this morning we come to you and we've mentioned conflict that is going on in the world and it doesn't matter what side of the globe it touches our heart. We know, our Father, that governments are affected as we've been learning from the book of Revelation uh, the kingdoms of this earth are temporal and there is an everlasting kingdom of our God and of his Christ that will establish righteousness and justice. In fact, the Bible teaches that those two things cannot be separate from one another. And we pray, our God, that your mighty hand will prevail and we pray that as we anticipate the return of our Savior, and particularly as he comes to reign as the glorified king, that today we would say, even so come, Lord Jesus. So bless our time together, we pray. Bless those that are not with us, those that are struggling with the issues and the affairs of life, be with them according to their need. We thank you, our Father, for safety along the way. We thank you for the bright prospect of a week before us and as we've been working our way through the winter weather, we're thankful for the projection of warmer days ahead and ask you, our God, to help us to always realize that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness and no shifting shadow. And so you are the light and all things remain the same in you. We ask your blessing upon us and we bless your holy name for you are worthy and we give you thanks in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our subject this morning is heaven. Heaven. Um, do I hear an amen? I, I know that uh, if Tim was uh, sitting, there he is. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I'm going to say uh, not only heaven, but heaven and home. And our prayer this morning, as we're gathered together here and as you're gathered with us, would be that the prospect of heaven and home would be a reality to you. And I have to say that many of the world's perspectives on subjects like this are often the realm of fantasy. And uh, I've seen the artist's conceptions of little chubby babies sitting on a cloud playing a golden harp. By, by the way, I like harp music. My sister Judy teaches harp. So I've got nothing against harps, and uh, I, I think that harp music is beautiful, but I, I, there will be other instrumentation. There will be, there'll be wind and, and trumpets and, and different other instruments that we're familiar with here on earth, uh, probably perfected uh, in the perfection that comes in, in our Lord, in, in our God. And uh, if you like music, uh, you'll enjoy heaven and you won't be a little chunky baby sitting on a cloud playing a harp. You'll, you'll be enjoying 
a new, an entirely new situation. The Bible describes as new heavens and new earth. And can I start by saying this? There are two places that God has made, that God has designed and created for humankind. Okay? This earth and what we will refer to this morning as heaven. And we're not talking about the heaven in which the birds fly or the heaven even that contains the stars in the, the celestial bodies. We're speaking of a city, by the way, that was promised to Abraham and he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God we're looking for that blessed city to come down from God out of heaven and to settle upon a, a new terrestrial, okay, a new terrestrial, I'm, I'm going to call it a planet. I, I hesitate to do that because it's not called a planet in Scripture, but what is this? This is a planet upon which we live, and we're going to look today at the destruction of this earth and to what degree the heavens above us and God is going to usher in new heavens and new earth. And the city of God, God's current dwelling and the dwelling place of departed souls, your loved ones who knew Jesus are there. That is going to come down from God out of heaven and the dwelling place of God shall be with man. And God knows, God knows what mankind, God knows what we enjoy. And designed this earth for our enjoyment. And, and it, he even visited this earth and he enjoyed it. And although there was the issue of sin and corruption in the world around him when Jesus was here, those things will be forever gone in the presence of our Lord in that new earth. And whatever's involved in the new heavens, I like to go way out there. I, I like to think, I like to think just as God is infinite. I like to think of limitless things. Well, God has made this earth for humankind, mankind, and he is also, as Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is also prepared for us. And of course, what we're going to look at today, I hope is a surprise to you because it's bigger than just the, the, the word that we mention and think of as heaven. It's bigger than that. Somebody might say, well, what about, what about that place that we read of last week, uh, hell? Uh, what about the lake of fire? Uh, wasn't that also created for the judgment of man? No, not at all. In fact, the word of God is clear that those places of judgment, those places where God will carry out his divine wrath against sin, they were created for the devil and his fallen angels. Humankind end up in that horrible place of, of judgment and fiery wrath by following Satan. Just as if I walked out that door today and you were to follow me, you'd go out that door. We said last week that God does not send people in to wrath and judgment. That comes from a decision that they have made themselves. And I want to be very clear about that. I, I want you to understand as you're learning theology that God is love and that love, just as God is infinite, so is the love of God infinite. And we need to absorb, we, we need to allow ourselves to be saturated with that thought and realize that God is not against us. He's, he's for us. And his every purpose is to 
established grace, mercy, and peace to his fallen creatures, those blessings that we don't deserve. Okay, our subject is heaven. And uh, I, where do we start? Well, I, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And is that describing the place that we're planning to go? Um, I, I don't think that when God created the heavens and the earth, this place that we are anticipating was in existence in the way that we're going to discuss it this morning because Jesus spoke of leaving earth to prepare it. And so there's perhaps a lot of discussion on what Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 means, but I want you to know we believe in the God of creation and I'm going to say, and this should not get anyone in trouble, I believe in a God who created the heavens and the earth and the things that we see around us in six actual days. And the reason why I believe that, the, the biggest reason why I believe that is because the work of redemption, God bringing about a plan whereby sinful men and women, boys and girls can be restored to a righteous standing a holy position before God. The Bible describes that as a greater work than creation itself. These worlds, and I mean, thank God for the Hubble, the Hubble telescope. It's amazing the pictures that they shoot from that thing, and there's a new one up there that's supposed to even be able to go further out into the universe. It's just, it's amazing. Um, God created all that by the word of his mouth. But to save our souls, for our sin to be dealt with in a righteous way by a holy God and true justice required that God give his life, that Jesus die for us And the work of redemption is infinitely greater than the work of creation. So as we are discussing these things this morning, I, I want you to be aware of the fact that uh, we're talking about things that are enormous. And uh, I, I, well, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead here because I was going to quote a little later from 2 Corinthians uh, the, the, the verse that says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard the things that God has prepared for those that love him. This, this, this is beyond our imagination. Human thought, the frailty of our minds cannot encompass the blessings of that belong to those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge this great salvation. Um, so, let's just say this. God has something bigger, better planned for you than anything that you might imagine in this life or in this world. That's why we encourage you that beyond your plans of a career and however many degrees you might want to accumulate in the local colleges and universities, these, these established places of learning, uh, that you set your sights, that you set your ambitions and goals on that which is above. Now, Jesus said that we should not become so 
earth-centric and earth-focused that we lose sight of what this whole thing is all about. And, and he said that we are to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. There's a whole new world coming that God wants us to be occupied with in such a way that the things of this world, as the, as the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Wow. What a huge subject. And I, I've got to get going on this because I'm supposed to cover two chapters today, chapter 20. 1 and 22, and I haven't even started them. So much to cover. But then again, uh, we're, we're talking about incredible things, things that are beyond our imagination. Now, we've mentioned in weeks past that there are three times in the book of Revelation where John beholds heaven open. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, he mentions seeing heaven open, and I have said again and again that the hope of all mankind is an open heaven. That's, if, if we're looking for the, the biggest and the best, then we want that the doors of that place where God's eternal glory is expressed, we want those doors to be open. I don't know if you've ever had a situation where and maybe you were in a rush to get somewhere because you had a ticket and you were going to see a particular demonstration or a particular performance and you got there and the doors were already shut. And that happens here at church sometimes because of you know our security system that we have and uh, after the worship music is over, they, they lock the doors and uh, we have ushers that are there to let people in, but there have been times when people came and the door was shut and they couldn't get in. And you know, That's not a good feeling. Now, can you imagine if the door, the entrance to God's blessed and eternal abode were shut in your face? The scripture describes those who will stand without a knock and say, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he'll say, depart from me. I don't know who you are. So it's important for us this morning to make sure that this open door and this personal knowledge, this relationship with Jesus Christ that is necessary for you to enter heaven has been established in your personal life. That you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you recognize what took place at Calvary was for you. I had a very good friend. He's, he's in heaven this morning, and I, I think he's playing a Hammond B3 organ up there. Um, his, his name was Victor Thomas, and Victor was the organist for a, a, a Motown rock and roll group from the 60s and 70s called Junior Walker and the All-Stars. And uh, Vic and I, we would talk a lot of music and, and so forth and so on. Uh, but, but Victor had a favorite song, and it went like this. Was it for me? For me alone, the Savior left his glorious throne. The dazzling splendors of the sky, was it for me he came to die? And the chorus says, it was for me. Yes, all for me. Oh, love of God, so great, so free. Oh, wondrous love, I'll shout and sing. He died for me, my Lord, the King. Is that the song that touches your heart this morning? Was it for me? Uh, he bowed his head upon the cross and freely shed his precious blood. That crimson tide, was it for me the Savior died? My friend Vic could never sing that chorus because when he got to that point, he'd go to tears. <laughs> he realized how great the price of redemption was and he used to say to me, if you don't understand why I go to tears, you don't understand what a horrible sinner I was. 
we were good enough friends that I had a pretty good idea. But the wonderful thing was all that, all that sin, all that iniquity, all that guilt was washed away when Jesus died upon the cross and paid the price of Victor's redemption. And he did that for you as well. Have you received it personally? Um, one of the first places that having to do with heaven being an abode, a place to live, is Psalms 23. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You've probably learned it. I, I recite the shepherd's psalm every morning after prayer. Every morning when I finish my prayers, I recite Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I recite that, and then I recite the Lord as my shepherd. And listen to the last words. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> That's heaven. That's what we call heaven. That is, that is that place where those who have departed this life to enter into the glory of the Lord, those who approach that open door go in to find a place that's prepared for them. That's what Jesus spoke about in John chapter 14, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead again, when he said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And, and I'm sure that as he spoke those words, there were those who, because they were so earthbound and so convinced that God's kingdom had only to do with this earth, they didn't understand a home above, a place in glory that Jesus was returning to and by the way, if you think this earth is wonderful, it took six days for this earth to be created. And Jesus left, what, uh, 2,000 years ago, and he's been working on a place for us there. How beautiful heaven must be, said the songwriter. Can, can, you, can you get into this this morning? Can, can you even, I mean, just let your imagination go to comprehend in, in maybe the most minute way what it is that God has planned for those who believe on his only begotten son. What, what a glorious thing. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 65, and I'm not going to turn there because that clock has no mercy, okay? It just keeps on moving. It's digital. <laughs> and I, I look up and it's every time. It just went to noon. Okay, here we are already. I got, I got to get going here. But in Isaiah 65, the prophet reciting, quoting God says, Behold, I create new heavens and earth. And, and you know, I, I've often wondered as, and I don't know how this worked, as Isaiah is receiving messages from God and and, and I don't know, maybe he was in bed and something comes to his heart and he gets up and says, I need to write, that's good, I need to write this down. And he gets up and he begins writing and he can't stop and uh, he's, he's weary and worn from a long day like the rest of the world, prophets need sleep too. And I, I can see him finally laying his head of, on the pillow and the, the pen or whatever he was writing with being laid down, falling maybe on the floor and the parchment that he was writing on there. And he wakes up in the morning. Whoa, <laughs> what's this? And I, of course, it's in his handwriting. But he reads these amazing things that the Spirit of God has revealed to him. And what must it have been for the prophet Isaiah to to read these words, who hath believed our report? 
And to whom is the arm of the Lord's salvation revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He is despised and we esteemed him not. Huh? And goes on to read, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed because of our sin. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement, the punishment for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord God has laid on him the Lord Jesus. Of course, the name of Jesus wasn't known. But the Lord God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Isaiah would look at what he had written by the influence and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he'd say something like this, perhaps. This is, this is a savior. This is one who can take all that I have ever done against God and can restore me to a right relationship with the Holy One. By the way, I remember a day in my life when a verse of scripture came alive to me and I realized that what God was describing was a savior and my little heart, my little heart said, that's what I need and I said yes to Jesus. Our prayer today for you is that that'll take place in your experience. But yes, 500 years before Jesus came and very obviously then uh, 2,500 plus years, this concept of new heavens and new earth and of course there's going to be another thousand years of a millennium that we've talked to you about. So, uh, but this was all predicted to the, to the prophet Isaiah so long ago. Behold, I create new heavens and new earth. We're, we're going to look at that if we ever get to it. We're going to look at that this morning in the book of Revelation. Behold, I make all things new, Jesus says. Um, Jesus spoke of this as the place of our eternal reward. The place where in our lives, we can, we can store up in heaven that which, I, I mean, if the, if the economy collapses today, there's going to be people whose 401k and all of their retirement plans are, I mean, even with inflation, I, I got a raise last year, but so did inflation. And I'm paying so much more, oh, let's not go there, but I, I am, I'm paying so much more for gas this week than I was two weeks ago. It ate up my raise. And what you gain in this life is, is something that you cannot depend on, but what you store up in this life, in that place of everlasting glory, can never fade away. Moth cannot eat holes in it, Rust cannot canker, cannot corrode it. Thieves cannot break through and steal. And Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven. I don't know what you're living for, but I hope I can get you today to set your perspective, to focus your eyes on the eternal future that God has ordained in glory for us and for our eternal reward. Jesus spoke of it as a place of comfort. Um, we, we hear those words from John 14 at, at funeral ceremonies, and, and I've used it so many times at a graveside where Jesus 
is saying, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he says, in my father's house are many dwellings, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself so that we can be together. That where I am, there you may be also. And at the end of that portion of scripture, he says to those that he's speaking with, he said, arise, let us go from this place. And I, I always use that at the end of a funeral to say, you know, we're here laying aside the remains of our departed loved one, but that's not where God wants us to stay. We need to move on. That's what our, that's what our departed loved one, our, our departed relative would want us to do, to move on from this and get on with our lives, uh, rise, let us go from this place. But we're still stuck on earth. What we're looking at this morning is what God has for us when we say farewell, when we say goodbye to this old corrupted planet. I mean, the Apostle Paul knew exactly what he was talking about in Romans when he said all creation groans waiting for redemption. And I'm old enough to say, along with those verses, that even we ourselves in our bodies, we groan. Oh, my aching back. You guys don't even know what that's about. You thought you had a sports injury. Wait until you get my age and just getting out of bed in the morning is everything you can do. I, I, I don't know what you're going through, Glenn, but oh my goodness. Now bad you. Now that all that stuff I do is good. <laughs> but God has for us, listen to this, an eternal weight of glory. Praise God. Bless his name. Now we know that getting from here to there involves an act of God. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to recite some of these things. Uh, we, we've read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 those words uh, that you know those who have gone before us will not uh, prevent those of us who remain behind. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And listening for Tim. He usually, he's behind the doors. He can't, I can't hear his amen. But that's what we're living for. And what a wonderful blessing it is to realize that we're going to be ushered out of here to ascend into the glorious presence of our Savior and our loving Heavenly Father who so loved the world that he died so we could be with him forever. Um, we know that these bodies that we, that this is our earthly house. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that, that this earthly house is is wearing down and it's going to be replaced with a with a transformed body that we might be like our Lord. Doors won't get in our way. Jesus came into that room where the disciples were, the doors being shut, and he said, Hi. And they thought that they had seen a ghost. They thought that they had seen some sort of a spirit apparition. And he says, No, no, no. Handle me and see. Go ahead, touch me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see me have. We're going to be like Jesus. When all our labors and trials are our, and we're safe on that beautiful shore just to be near the dear Lord we adore, will through the ages be glory for me. I don't know if you're excited this morning, but I'm, I'm, just, starting to, I'm just starting to feel this. And it feels good. And the wonderful thing is, this prospect is for all those who believe. 
our transformed bodies. First Corinthians chapter 15, and I, I, I have to, I'm, I'm going to turn there. I, I have to tell you this morning, there's stuff in here that I have spoken to my theologian, my Bible scholar friends, and you talk about degrees, I, I've got friends that have, they have masters of divinity, and they have doctorates in theology. Some of them have doctorates in theology from two different seminaries, and they are so smart that when I sit next to them, I, I just feel like a little boy in class. And I've asked them about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and um, they said, well, you know, it's obviously God's word, but I have to tell you the details of it are so, they're so far out there. There's really something here preaching go far out. <laughs> they're so far out there that I'm not sure exactly what they mean, uh, but it speaks of, and here's the words from Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. First Corinthians 15 and 22, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who belong to Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign. Till he had put all enemies under his feet. We've been talking about that in the regard of the millennium and even with what's going on in the world today. I want you to know Jesus is in control. He must reign till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You want to talk about that for a while? Nobody likes to talk about death. My my friends who are undertakers, we don't call them that anymore. Uh, we call them funeral directors. It's a little more comfortable. You know, you know, the undertaker, you know, it sounds like something out of a bad movie. But uh, when Jesus comes, they're going to be out of business. There will be no funeral directors in heaven. There will be no funerals. So I won't be able to Preach my little sermon from John 14. It'll have whole new meaning to me then. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet, and when he said all things are put under him, it is clear, it's manifest that he is the exception. He is accepted, which did put all things under him, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall, get this, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. Huh? I just, I look at that, and I just have no idea of how big that is, but that's, that's God's final I don't even know what word to use here. But this is the accomplishment that will bring about the end of all things for the beginning of a situation in which God will be all and in all. Wow. You can say that frontwards and backwards. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And here we are today trying to comprehend eternal glory. Um, leading up to where we're going, okay? If you got your finger in your Bible, we're, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. But let me just say to you, we're going to read something there that Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 14, about the earth being burned up, being dissolved, and the elements melting with fervent heat. And the earth and all its works will be destroyed. And God is going to usher in new heavens and new earth. And that brings us to verse 1 of chapter 21. Go with me there. And I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. That doesn't mean you're not going to be able to go surfing. Be aware of the fact that in Bible days, the idea of the ocean and the power of those waves and the idea that somewhere out there, earth came to an end. Not that they believe the earth was flat. By the way, the Bible teaches us about the circle of the earth. And that's why uh, Christopher Columbus, that's why different others of those early men that uh, <laughs> they borrowed boats to do it. That was smart. But they, they, they believed that they could reach the east by going west. And people laughed. But they knew that because of what scripture teaches. And scientists long before Galileo and others that were teaching, for an example, that the earth is not the center of the, of the universe, they were burned at the stake. And yet the King James translators in 1611 spoke of the sun as being our day star. And just a few years before that, there was several different scientists who were killed for their idea that, um, well, people at that time believed that everything revolved around the earth. We've come a long way, haven't we? Huh? And the wonderful thing is, is that the scripture fits because it's truth. And I, John, saw the whole, hear this. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And can I say, and this is not to insult anybody, but you could be the homeliest, you could be the homeliest specimen of human femininity. But I'll tell you what, I've seen some homely gals on their wedding day and I don't know, I don't know what it costs to get that transformation done, but that dress and the hairdo and all of the rest of the stuff. And when the announcement, here comes the bride and she walks down the aisle, oh my goodness, if it was somebody you worked with, you, we'd say, I hardly recognized her. That's us. In a coming day as the bride of Christ. We are going to appear as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, God's dwelling place, is with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and shall be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And by the way, that's the term used in death. The stuff we used to know is gone, dead and gone. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, put that in writing. Look at this. Verse 5, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now you might like Randy Alcorn's book, and I, I'm not one to throw away the baby with the bathwater, as we say. But Randy Alcorn, in his book called Heaven, believes that the earth and the heavens are going to be, I, I'm going to say it like this, they're going to be revitalized, they're going to be, re, there's going to be a sticker on them that says reman, remanufactured. Because science says that matter can be neither created nor destroyed. Well, wait a minute, didn't that come from God in the first place? And I think Peter knows what he talks about when he says that these things are going to be dissolved and gone. And I believe that Jesus knows what he's talking about. And I'm going with the words of Jesus when he says, Behold, I make all things new. The Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong on this. 
We are not going to find ourselves dwelling eternally in a remanufactured world. This planet that has been so destroyed by the crazy intentions and purposes of mankind is going to be gone forever and God will establish new heavens and new earth and God says to John put that in writing because these words are true and faithful and he said unto me it is done I, I think I think Jesus enjoys on the cross he said it is finished here at the end of the age he says it is done I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my child. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and drug users and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death that happened in last week's sermon, if you remember from chapter 20. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me saying, come here, I want to show you the bride, the uh, lamb's wife. I'm, I want to show you Jesus' bride. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a great wall and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel on the east gate, three, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, on the west, three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Can I say to you, this is where the Old Testament and the New Testament the covenanted people of God in the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come together with the covenant promises that God has given to us, the church, in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have the 12 apostles, and you have the 12 sons of, of, of Jacob, the 12 sons of Israel come together in the building, in the structure of this city of God. He that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. The city lies four square. The length is as large as the breadth. He measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. That's about 1,400 miles. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. 1,400 miles long by 1,400 miles wide by 1,400 miles high. And before you say, oh, that's a great big cube. No, I think that I think that it's a pyramid. Because there is a chief cornerstone in only one design of structure, and that would be a pyramid, a cornerstone that would be at the very top. And that chief cornerstone will be the throne of God and Jesus will be the light of this city and there will be no need for a son in that holy city because the throne of the Lamb is the light thereof. This is, this is, so, this is so amazing. And he measured the wall thereof 140 and four cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was jasper. The city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophys chrysophysus. I don't know what some of these stones are. They are not the birth stones, okay? 
the 11th adjacent and the 12th and amethyst. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. The street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, only those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name written there? Are you known of God in the redemption of Jesus Christ? Have you been to the, the cleansing power? Have you come to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Has there been that moment of redemptive knowledge that has taken place in your soul? And do you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ as you're sitting there today or wherever you might be listening to this message? Our prayer is this, that if you haven't come to Jesus, that today you'll recognize he's all you need. And you'll simply come to him as a sinner, as one who has violated the righteous law of God and has, has in your own life turned from his justice and his holiness, I want you to know that today he can take every sin and every disobedience and he can wash you whiter than the snow. We're going to have to read chapter 22 at another time or you can read it at your leisure. But if what we just looked at in chapter 21, my, my, my friend Vic would say flat blows off your hat. Um, you'll really like what you see in chapter 22. And I hope that if you haven't been convinced of the blessings that God has in store for you as, as a child of God, that today you'll come in faith to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We've covered so much ground today. When we think of the size of this city of God that will come down from God out of heaven and be upon this new earth. It's going to it's going to take eternity to really be able to survey the enormity of this city alone, let alone those things that will be ours in the new earth. Father, help our minds today to be expanded beyond human measure and beyond what our minds and our, our little imaginations can even contain. And might we trust in you today? Might we find you to be all that we need? Might we say of that redemptive work at Calvary, it was for me. For me alone, the Savior left his glorious throne. It was for me he left the splendors of the sky. It was for me he came to die. And I pray that there'd be those today who would put their confidence in the finished work of the cross and in the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ who has proven to us that our sin is gone. We bless your holy name in his name. Amen.